Rebecca from Chemnitz. And it's time to leave no dye behind. Right here I have a little bit of some Derma Chartreuse. I forget how much I had originally measured and then I used this dye in a few different projects. I have some super tiny remnants, like minuscule amounts of some fluorescent fuchsia and purple pop um, rinsed out of containers and also a very, very tiny amount of some ox blood. And we are gonna use these remnants to dye some yarn. We also have a leftover dye bath here. Uh, this dye bath had some of the same colors in it, also a little bit of black, but there is a hint of some pink left in the water because I, it's still warm. I didn't leave the yarn in here to cool completely. And so I thought we'd start by adding our yarn in to just see how much color there was with that residual pink. And it looks like there is a little bit of color in here from that, but I would classify this as like a blush color. Um, that's really not a ton of pigment. And on camera, is it showing up? I mean, it definitely wasn't nothing, but it was very, very subtle. So I'm gonna put on gloves and I think I wanna set this aside so that way we can layer these colors on slowly. But I was curious about the amount of color in here, which it's really not showing up in person. I do see a blush pink. You know what? I have a tiny bit of like a little black hint over there. Why not add it? But I'm gonna start with our little bit of pink. And you can see that it went in, but there's not a lot of color there. But I also wanna add a liter of water. Um, this is both gonna cool things off in here a little bit, and uh, it's gonna give us more space. So that way when we add this yarn in, we'll be able to move it around. This yarn is Wool to Die For's Crazy 8 DK. It is 100% superwash merino wool. Um, and spread the colors out on it. Now again, I just dunked it in briefly and removing it. I don't think that that took up a lot of the pinks or anything that we had added in, which again, are super subtle. Uh, but I'm just trying to go slow. And this is really all of that little hint of oxblood red that we have. Again, just a blush. Uh, the heat is actually off. Um, and so I feel okay sticking my hands in. Now that oxblood color is one that soaks up quickly, but I don't think we're really gonna be seeing it on our fiber at all because, I mean, yes, we have a very blush color, which, man, it's really not coming through. Uh, do I have any bare yarn? Okay, here in the bucket, that is some bare yarn. And this is our pink color, uh, just for a little comparison. There is some color in here, it's just very subtle. All right, now I'm coming in with our chartreuse. And this is gonna look dark compared to everything else we've had so far. Now, I have mixed chartreuse with, or sorry, with radioactive, Dharma's radioactive green with purple pop before. Um, but I don't think I've mixed just specifically fluorescent fuchsia with radioactive. But now I'm just curious what this color will be. I'm bringing the yarn in and moving it around and honestly, it's looking yellow which is surprising me a little bit. Um, it's turning this, this yellow color, which is, it's interesting. It's a little bit, I don't, I, it's not fair to call it ugly. Um, you know what? It reminds me a lot of the kind of color that I would get from dandelions or other natural dyes, uh, if I'm being completely honest. Okay, that's the color we're getting here and Hmm, I'll be honest, it's okay, but it isn't exactly my favorite. So what are my choices here? My choices would be to heat set this, to finish this color 
and let it be. Um, and it is like a yellow green color. It's not bad, but as I said, it's not my favorite. So what I'm gonna do is bring in some other color because why not? Um, this is a dye stock that I have of some extreme blue plus um, some fluorescent fuchsia. I used this in another video. And I'm bringing this in. Again, not a lot. I just squirted some of it in here. But to see where this will bring our color and then what we might want to do. If we might want more of it because really I did not add very much at all. But I'm just going to layer color on slowly and see if we're going to bring us someplace that I like a little bit better. Okay, that is bringing us more, more green for sure. Um, and so I'm liking that. I think I want to still feel like a yellowy green, but I want to add some more of this. So I'm coming in with more of this mixture, which is a blurpily mixture. Now it would be really easy for me to overdo this. <laughs> for me to add too much of this mixture uh, and so to take the color to blue. Um, hopefully I haven't done that already, but let's see where we are. And yeah, we might be taking it a little too blue, but maybe not, we'll see. There's still definitely pinks in the water. Um, and so it's hard because the water itself looks very blue, so you can see a lot of that. And the blue is actually striking in a very, very cool way. Um, I think that the extreme blue is probably striking a little bit faster than some of the other pigments in here. And I like this so much more. It's definitely got more blue in it, but the blue is almost... In some respects, it's almost glazed on here. So we're definitely in a bluer place versus a more yellow place. It is not a bright green, but I'm gonna lean into this and I'm gonna not add more dye. And now we're gonna turn on the heat um, and let these pinks absorb and see where we are. Since we have diluted this and removed some of the acid, I do wanna add some more acid to Three tablespoons of vinegar should be more than sufficient. But the fun thing about layering the colors in this way slowly and a little bit at a time is that it allowed me to make changes to this slowly, but it also is giving us some more complexity to the overall color because each time you layer, things are slightly uneven and this is definitely more even than some of my layered tonals, but I'm excited and curious to see where we end up. So anyway, I'm gonna heat this for 30 minutes and then I'll be back. The 30 minutes are up and there's only a tiny little hint of pink remaining here. We've got this beautiful, more muted green. It is a, a little too blue for me to call it mossy, but I, there's also more yellow hints in here as well. It's gorgeous. I'm gonna leave it here in the pan to cool for a while. Uh, I don't know if I'll let it cool completely or what, but I'm just gonna leave it in here and maybe it'll suck up a little more pink. Maybe it won't. I'm not worried about it. Okay, getting ready to wash our yarn and it is almost completely cooled in the dye bath. There maybe is a tiny, tiny hint of color left in there, but most of the color is in the yarn. And wow, you can see here, we've got some more yellow and more blue areas. This is so subtle and pretty. I'm gonna put it into a rinse bath and now we can wash it. It would not be super surprising if we see a little bit of pink bleed. Um, I mean, I guess it would because there's not very much pink in here, but that is something that can happen with pinks at times. And especially on the first rinse, if there was some left in the dye bath, then you can sometimes see it. But even with soap in here, I'm not seeing any color come out. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and rinse out all the soap. Then I'm gonna put this yarn through my spin dryer, hang it up to dry, and we'll take a closer look at the finished yarn. Here is the finished yarn base. And I am so, so happy that I decided to edit the color and add some of that bluish mixture in. The original color was like a yellowish green that was very reminiscent of colors I get from natural dyeing, which don't get me wrong, can be cool, but I wanted something, I don't know, a little different. That yellow color could have been fun in some kind of set, or I would have liked that color if I was dyeing a variegated yarn. But personally, for a tonal yarn, ultimately, I wanted, I don't know, a color I liked better. And so therefore, this is an example of how sometimes when I'm leaving no dye behind, um, I get magical results, magical colors. And other times I get something that I'm just not that big a fan of. And if you're not a big fan of something that you're dyeing, you can change it. <laughs> that is always an option. You can be using leftover dyes and then go, I guess technically my stash of dye stocks are all leftover dyes as well. They're just dye stocks that are have a measured concentration that I can use for another project. But there's no reason why a Leave No Dye Behind yarn can't be a project. And maybe, maybe this isn't a problem that other people have. Because when I'm filming videos here, I have two main types, two main categories of videos. Dye Pot Weekly, which involves a little bit more planning. And then Leave No Dye Behind, where I just take whatever I have left from a day of filming and throw it all together in some kind of fast way. But sometimes I make a video with leftover dyes a Dye Pot Weekly, and so there's no reason why in a Leave No Die Behind video, I can use more than just what I have left over to get a color that I want. I mean, a lot of times with these Leave No Die Behind videos, I get colors that I love, that are unique, that are not reproducible. And this color isn't very reproducible either because I don't have a recipe for it. Uh, there's random proportions of all of these pigments. But a Leave No Die Behind doesn't have to be just your dye leftovers. Just look at the yarn closer and you see more yellow and more blue areas. It's so pretty. I always forget how much I love this Crazy 8 base. I love how bouncy and full these eight plies get. And that's part of the reason why I eventually want to use the worsted weight version of this yarn for a sweater, but somehow I keep pushing back and working on other things. And one of these days, I will finish this very long, drawn out dying to knit project. Twist it up, you can really see that subtle variation of color. I think I'm possibly the only one that cares a ton about the distinction. However, I think that part of the point I'm trying to make as I ramble on uh, is applicable to many of us. When you are dying yarn and you have a vision or you have a recipe, if you're not satisfied with whatever that final color is, you can always edit it, as long as it's not black. If it's too dark, it's hard to edit that further, but you can remove yarn from the dye bath sooner if you think you've added too much dye, and then remove some of the dye. And so there, there are many opportunities to edit your colorway during the dyeing process, even though you can't exactly take dye away. But if you don't like the color you have, you can over dye it and add more color. And this was more, of me doing this in the middle of the project versus waiting, seeing the dry yarn, and then over dyeing it then, which is also something you can do. And I have a whole over dyeing playlist. A lot of the yarn in there is commercially dyed yarn that I then over dyed, but there's no reason why you can't over dye hand dyed yarn, whether it was dyed by you or another indie dyer. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and I really hope you've enjoyed this video. Please subscribe, turn on notifications, and do all the YouTube-y things. It really does help, I promise. And I have to say, I kind of wish I had a recipe for this one. I know as I go back and edit the video, I could attempt to keep track of some notes sometimes, but in this case, when I had random amounts of dye dissolved in random amounts of water, it's really hard to say how much color was left in each situation. The closest premixed dye color that this makes me think of is maybe sage leaf, but I don't know if I've ever looked at that color at a 1% depth of shade. Thank you so much for watching.